Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Introduction to the Psychology of uh, Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Varma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur. This is the third lecture of the second week. You might remember that we were talking about uh, the ability to perceive uh, uh, you know phonemes and phonemic, uh, phonemic contrasts in the native language and also in bilingual uh, scenarios. Uh, in today's lecture or in today's and uh, you know in the upcoming lectures, I am going to talk a little bit more about how do infants build upon this ability to perceive phonemic contrast uh, to basically start uh, uh, you know developing uh, to basically start developing uh, this ability to perceive words from a continuous stream of speech. So, you might have noticed that we typically you know when we are talking to children or say for example, let us even not talk about children here, but say for example, if you are if you are listening to a speech, if you are watching a movie, listening to a song, songs are uh, relatively easier, but if you are listening to a speech, uh, rather monotonous one in a language that you do not know, it sometimes becomes very difficult to actually keep the words apart from each other. Sometimes people would speak so fast and if you do not know the language, it becomes very, very difficult for uh, speakers, for listeners of a different language to be able to segment the continuous stream of speech into words. The word boundaries are not clear, there are typically no uh, you know clues as to how uh, you know where is one word ending and the other word starting. So, that is something which is very, very interesting. Also, if you pay attention to how individuals speak, when we are speaking fluently, we are speak in a continuous stream of speech and unless you are already aware of these words, unless you can start picking up, oh, this word came here and that word came there, you will not be able to sort of, uh, you know, uh, segment this stream of speech. It is pretty much the case of, uh, you know, it is pretty much the case uh, also uh, with, uh, you know, when we are talking to infants, while unless we are taking a special effort in talking to children in the way that we are slowing down our speech, we are highlighting certain word endings and word beginnings, we are uh, you know uh, pointing out and sort of you know helping them out understand may, may, maybe uh, slowing down the movements of the uh, mouth and so on. Uh, it is in that sense equally difficult for infants, probably much more difficult for infants to be able to uh, segment the continuous stream of speech into words. This particular problem which concerns the segmentation of speech into segmentation of continuous speech into words is referred to as the segmentation problem. Today, I am going to talk to you about the segmentation problem. As infants, you know, uh, you, you can see and as I just mentioned, uh, it is the problem of segmentation is even more challenging for the infants because they have only just started to pick up the basic sounds of, you know, the language that they are uh, seeking to learn. And although the sounds are the building blocks of these words, they overlap a lot, they uh, you know the mix with each other a lot, there is a lot of co-articulation that goes into uh, when they are you know that goes into speaking which the infants are probably not you know very easily being able to make out. Also infants also later have to start connecting words to meaning. So, for example, it is not merely that they can start seeing, oh, these are the word boundaries, they actually have to connect these words to meanings uh, for their journey, you know, for this activity to be actually useful in their journey of acquiring that language. So, not only infants have to segment this uh, continuous uh, fluent uh, stream of speech into words, they also have to sort of uh, attach these specific words, let us say that they are able to segment to meanings because that is how the learning of the language which actually commends. Now, since there are no obvious clues for infants to tackle the speech segmentation problem, the researchers have wondered as to what kinds of uh, techniques, what kinds of strategies they might be using uh, and what kind of strategies might actually be helpful for the children uh, which help them to segment this continuous stream of speech. 
This con consideration becomes even more fascinating if you, uh, you know, look at the fact that around 12 months of age or so, children have a vocabulary of about 50 to 100 words. But around 18 months of age, they experience what is called a word spurt or a vocabulary spurt differently in different uh, books you will find it. Uh, and from then onwards, their vocabulary starts expanding almost exponentially. So while we have been pondering about that, you know, segmenting speech is a very difficult problem and so on and so forth, it is very fascinating that children actually crack this problem by around 12 to 18 months of age. Within this period, somewhere they get the hack of how to, uh, you know, segment uh, the uh, stream of speech into words and also attach those words to meanings, okay. So this is basically what is going to be the focus of the next couple of lectures. So. Uh, what are the candidate abilities, you know, how are people actually do, how are infants actually doing it because that is our, uh, you know, subject of consideration. Now, researchers have actually proposed that infants are able to exploit the statistical properties of the speech input, more specifically the regularity and patterns of combination of speech sounds into words to solve the segmentation problem. Now, remember, if you remember the, uh, you know, the diagram that I showed, the figure, uh, uh, you know, Cole's uh, chronology of uh, speech uh, perception, uh, you will see that around 5.5 to 6 months of age is where they started paying more attention to specific combination of speech sounds, you know, the phonotactics. So, uh, maybe around this time, uh, they are sort of paying and they have to pay more attention to these phonotactic abilities in order to start segmenting speech. Let us look at this in more detail. So, Jushik and Aslin in 1995 have tried to find out the age at which these infants start recognizing the sound patterns of words in corrected speech. What did they do? They familiarized a group of 7.5 month old infants from American English homes with two monosyllabic words by presenting them repeatedly for some time. So it could be any monosyllabic word, pat, bat, mat, hat, anything and they basically repeated these words for a, you know, for a given span of time until they were familiarized. Afterwards, what they did was they tested these infants by presenting four passages each consisting of six sentences. Two of these passages contained six repetitions of the words they were previously familiarized with and two passages contained six repetitions of two novel words that they had not been familiarized with. Now, what would, would you predict? Uh, the authors predicted that if the infants were actually noticing the similarity between the words that they had learned during familiarization phase and the words that are presented embedded in passages now in the test phase, there would be a difference in listening times between these four passages. The two passages that contain familiar words will be listened to much more than the two passages that contain repetitions of novel words. Indeed, that is exactly what they find. They find that the listening times for passages containing the familiar words were significantly longer than the listening times for passages containing novel words. This led to the conclusion that around 7.5 month old, uh, you know, 7.5 month old uh, uh, infants can actually isolate you know, words from fluent speech, at least the ones that they have actually heard in isolation or have been familiarized with. Now, interestingly, the same ability could not be demonstrated for six-month-old infants using the same protocol and the same experiment, suggesting that this ability to isolate words from speech develops somewhere between six to seven point five months of age. This is a decent demonstration, but you could say that uh, in the test phase of the previous experiment, uh, participants or infants were able to hear these words in isolated, uh, uh, you know, in, in isolation, which is not really the case in, uh, you know, natural scenarios. In natural scenarios, typically children are constantly hearing uh, words in embedded speech, you know, words embedded in uh, fluent stream of speech. So, uh, Jushik and Aslin were also sort of uh, curious and what they did was they performed a very similar experiment. This time Time, more closely mimicking the natural, uh, you know, segmentation scenarios. And what they did here was that they presented these group of 7.5 month olds with words embedded in passages. And in the test phase, they presented uh, lists of words, four lists of words, two lists containing one of the two words that had been occurred, occurring in the passages and two consisting of repetitions of either of the two novel words. Again, you could see here that infants listen to the words that they were familiarized with much more than they listen to the words that they were not familiar with. 
basically telling us that either way children by the age of 7.5 months uh, of age are capable of isolating words from speech uh, and they are sort of able to recognize what are the familiar words in any given discourse. But how are they doing it? You know, what is it that is helping them do this? We have established now that by around 7.5 months of age, they are capable of isolating, uh, you know, uh, words from speech. But how are they doing it? Safran and colleagues tried to answer this question. You know, they proposed a mechanism of statistical learning to explain the ability of these 7.5 month olds. How did they do this? They tested this idea by exposing a group of 8 month olds from an American English linguistic setup to 2 minutes of fluent synthesized speech, nonsensical speech, uh, which was devoid of any other clues, any familiarity, any meaning uh, relations and so on. This speech stream consisted of four trisyllabic nonsense words like pa bi ku, ti bu do, uh, go la tu and do ra pi. So you can see pa bi ku, three syllables, ti bu do, three syllables, go la tu uh, and do ra pi. So there are four of these words which are trisyllabic words and this stream did not contain any pauses, any stress differences, any rhythm differences, anything like that. So that only the statistical probability of that, uh, you know, uh, pa is followed by b is followed by ku is what they have, all right. The only way, therefore, these infants could isolate these words would be these transitional probabilities that I mentioned. So, for example, B follows pa with 100% probability, uh, ku follows B with 100% probability and so on and so forth. Now, what did they do during the test phase? During the test phase, the infants were presented with repetitions of two out of the four words, during, uh, two out of the four words that they were presented in training and with repetitions of two new three syllable words. So, two words, two three syllable words were from the pre test phase, from the familiarization phase and two new uh, trisyllabic words from the, uh, you know, were something that was not presented earlier. Now, while infants might have encountered these syllables both in the familiarization and test phases and this, uh, again, uh, this, these two new uh, trisyllabic words that they have sort of uh, concocted are very interesting because they have been created by combining the first, uh, you know, the, the final syllable of one of the earlier words with the first two syllables of the following words. Say, for example, in pa bi ku, ti bu do and uh, Gola P, what they are doing is, say for example, Dora P, uh, the P from, uh, they are combining it with Gola 2, uh, the Go and La uh, from this uh, previous word. So, it basically creates uh, words like uh, Tuda Ro and Pigola, which are basically, again, these syllables might have been heard earlier, but they have not been heard with equal probability. When they hear this Pabiku, Tibudo, uh, Pabiku, Tibudo, Golatu, and uh, Dorapi, they are actually hearing these coming together more frequently uh, with more, uh, you know, higher probability than what they have heard uh, of Tudaro coming together or Pigola coming together. So the difference is while the syllables are also the same, the transitional probabilities are different. Transitional probability basically meaning uh, with what probability a particular syllable follows the other, okay. So if now in this scenario, infants uh, would be able to distinguish uh, between the familiarization words and the test words, it would indicate that they are able to decipher the transitional probabilities of the combination of these syllables from the speech stream. And indeed, this is what was found. The infants could actually, uh, you know, recognize the words from the familiarization phase, even though that, even though they contain very similar syllables to words in the test phase, uh, but uh, things that occurred more frequently together with higher probability were recognized better. So this sort of tells us, Safran would say, uh, Safran and colleagues would say uh, that infants are actually paying a lot of attention to the transitional probabilities of these uh, syllables occurring one after the other. Safran further wanted to strengthen these findings and what they did was they uh, demonstrated that infants are not only able to sort of isolate these uh, combination of phonemes, these, trans uh, uh, these combination of syllables together, but they are actually treating the output of this statistical learning process as actual potential words. So what did they do? 
in a study they actually uh, familiarized a group of 8 month old uh, infants with uh, four three syllabic uh, nonsense words just like pabiku tibudo golapi and so on and they presented them in either a sentence context oh what a nice pabiku what a nice tudaro and so on and so forth or in a nonsense context so zifike nipi uh, pabiku and so on so where word in the first sentence context you can see it is a meaningful context the word is being used as an actual object name or something like that whereas in the second one in a nonsense context it is just a stream of speech with all of these syllables coming together now saffron proposed that these if these infants were actually treating these uh, you know uh, trisyllabic uh, concoctions as actual words uh, they would recognize them better in the English, in the sentence context rather than in the nonsensical context and again this is exactly what was found the infants listened longer to these syllables when they were presented in the sentence context rather than when they were presented in the nonsensical context so basically what we are seeing is if you you know uh, put together the lectures uh, from this week together what we are seeing is a chronological development of how children are per learning to perceive speech they initially learn to perceive the differences between phonemes and then they uh, started putting together the sequences of phonemes together and here you are seeing that they are being able to use that ability to isolate words from a continuous stream of speech Safran studies indeed demonstrate the fact that infants are sensitive to the sequential probabilities of speech segments. Here we are talking about syllable size frames, but similar study, a similar uh, uh, you know uh, aspects have been demonstrated. Say, for example, the study of Chambers and colleagues that infants are also sensitive to phoneme to the probability of occurrence of separate phonemes as well. So infants are basically picking up on the statistical regularities in the input at the level of phonemes, at the level of syllables, probably at the level of words and so on as well. But these two were sort of, you know, uh, artificial scenarios. So, Saffron studies are very interesting and they very uh, neatly demonstrate that children are paying attention to, uh, you know, these scenarios, uh, the statistical uh, distribution and the transitional probabilities. But again, these were artificial speeches and so on. And so, people were curious as to what will happen in real language scenarios, you know, when we are talking, uh, presenting them actual language input. So, Jushik and colleagues in 1993, uh, they sort of tried to address this and they presented American and Dutch 9 month old infants with a series of Dutch and English word lists. Interestingly, each list contained words that conformed with the phonotactic rules of one language but not the other. Say for example, an English word list obviously be chosen such that it would follow the conventions or transitional probabilities of English but not of Dutch and a Dutch word list was constructed such that it would follow the phonotactic constraints of uh, Dutch but not English. And they sort of asked these children to sort of, you know, perform the similar scenario. Uh, and uh, the results actually showed that American infants listened significantly longer to English words, whereas, uh, and less longer to Dutch word lists, whereas the Dutch infants obviously listened much longer to Dutch words uh, than English words. So, basically what we are seeing is that the same sort of happens the same pattern of transition picking up transitional probabilities happens in real language scenarios real word lists as well and interestingly if you note that children are sort of picking up the transitional probabilities specific to their language and not more generally as was happening in the case of perceiving phonemic contrasts in a different study uh, with Catalan Spanish 10 month olds, Sebastian Gauls and Bosch uh, provided evidence for the fact that growing up as bilinguals actually does not delay, so does not significantly delay the individual's acquisition of phonotactic development. Okay, uh, So what did they do? In one experiment they presented 10 month old infants growing up in either Catalan speaking or Spanish speaking monolingual families with list of non-words all having a CVCC structure. Now, CVCC is basically consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant uh, and basically what happens is that in Catalan uh, en word endings with CC clusters are actually legitimate, they are uh, legal whereas in Spanish it does not really happen uh, at all. So, these CVCC, CVCC structures are actually valid for Catalan uh, uh, speaking individuals but not for Spanish speaking individuals. Also, interestingly what they did was that half of the list presented to both Catalan and Spanish infants consisted of non-words with legal 
Catalan ending cl clusters like Bert and Kursk and the other half with illegal Catalan end clusters like Keter and Datl. Note that while half of them are actually legal and acceptable in Catalan, so Bert and Kursk are legal and acceptable in Catalan, uh, whereas Keter and Datl are not, all four of these are not legal for Spanish individuals because in Spanish the word endings do not end with the, the CC and you know two consonants together. The results actually showed that around 10 month old in, uh, Catalan infants could actually discriminate between legal and illegal Catalan end clusters as indexed in longer listening times to list, uh, to list containing legal non-words than to those containing illegal non-words. So Catalan speaking individuals are being able to make this distinction between the two types of CC clusters that are uh, you know being found and hence they are demonstrating the sensitivity to the phonotactic constraints of Catalan. For Spanish, for Spanish speaking infants, neither of this makes sense, so they obviously do not show any difference between whether the cluster is legal or illegal because they are both illegal for the Spanish uh, individuals. So, to establish the same in the bilingual setting, the authors replicated the same experiment with Catalan Spanish bilingual to be infants, you know, simultaneous bilinguals who had been exposed to same uh, to both these languages since birth. Now, here. Uh, they did, uh, they introduced a very interesting quirk. Two types of groups were tested. One group was Catalan dominant, so their exposure to Catalan was 60%, Spanish was 40%, and the other group was Spanish dominant, whereas their exposure to uh, Spanish were 60% and Catalan was 40%. Now, in this scenario, three kinds of outcomes could happen. What are those? If mere just exposure to uh, you know Catalan and Spanish uh, uh, you know leads to phonotactic sensitivity, then both groups of monolinguals should behave as their Catalan monolingual peers. Basically, saying that because Catalan Spanish and Spanish Catalan, both groups of bilinguals have some knowledge of Catalan, they should actually behave like Catalan monolingual peers and be able to distinguish between legal and non-legal uh, end clusters. However, if the amount of exposure matters, so how much of Catalan they have been uh, getting, if that matters, then you could say that the largest effect would be found in Catalan monolinguals, then in Catalan dominant bilinguals, and then in Spanish bi uh, dominant bilinguals. A third thing could happen, whereas you can say that just language, if just language dominance is all right, if just that language dominance is uh, sort of uh, you know uh, sufficient, then Catalan dominant bilinguals would also behave much similar to uh, you know uh, your Catalan speaking monolinguals, and this is what these individuals set out to test. What did the results show? The results actually supported the language dominance hypothesis, basically showing that the effects were equally large for Catalan monolingual and Catalan Spanish bilingual infants. What does this tell us? It tells us that te for 10 month old monolingual uh, uh, Catalan infants and Catalan dominant infants, they had both developed the phonotactic sensitivity for Catalan although the latter were yet to develop the same for the non-dominant or uh, language or Spanish. If they had developed that for Spanish as well, then maybe they would sort of get a bit confused and start rejecting both of them, but they had developed it for Catalan, not so much for Spanish so far. So language dominance is a very interesting factor, language dominance is a very uh, uh, important factor in how children are developing and gaining these phonotactic constraints. So, to summarize, the combined results from these studies indicate that infants indeed are capable of recognizing the recurring syllable sequences in the speech input, you know, the statistical uh, regularities in the speech input. The underlying mechanism as Safran has uh, very well demonstrated is very similar to a statistical learning mechanism, more like a general statistical learning mechanism, uh, which is sensitive to the sequential or transitional probabilities of how syllables or phonemes occur uh, one after the other, even in the absence of any kinds of prosodic cues, you know, rhythm, tempo, stress and so on and so forth. And it helps in the segmentation and this is what they are using to, uh, you know, segment the continuous stream of speech. This ability is supposed to, you know, help these uh, infants to bootstrap the learning of words, bootstrap the acquisition of vocabulary uh, in infants and it starts very early from around 1.5, uh, from around 7.5 to 8 months onwards. So this is 
one of the candidate abilities that we uh, you know we are talking about uh, is uh, you know very very relevant to segmentation of speech finally the third part which sort of you can conclude from this is that you know the performance of catalan dominant and catalan monolingual infants were very very similar and that actually could be taken to you know conclude that growing up as a bilingual does not necessarily delay the acquisition of these uh, you know phonotactics in catalan or in uh, you know in catalan uh, uh, or in spanish because what they are doing is they are still being able to pick up the phonotactic constraints of that second language all right so that's all that i wanted to share in this lecture i'll meet you in another one uh, where we'll be talking about an alternative way of picking up uh, you know or tackling the word segment uh, language segmentation problem all right thank you so much